it's just astonishing that all the stuff it really is coming out to uh, to do with, for instance, I was talking about uh, VL, uh, H, VLF uh, frequencies and ELF frequencies and how they've been using that and experimenting on the publics for an awful long time. Now they're using it pretty well consistently, 24 hours a day across America and Canada, probably other countries too. And I've, I know that, that to put up Stanford's chart, they've got a whole array of them across the world with a map on it. We can see all the different locations of these heart projects that, you know, pulse our brains because docile and fairly happy. Because it's very important, and we find big authors who help plan this stage of society um, and who are involved in it, too, like the Huxley's, for instance, and Huxley's both uh, were involved in the Tavistock Institute where they stuck wires in people's brains and long before uh, Delgado came along, and they were making people turn left and right and sit down, stand up, and do all these kind of things by remote control. They thought it was just wonderful creating a society like that, be awfully, awfully peaceful, as long as no one blew a fuse. But anyway, uh, it's far more advanced than that today. They can do things remotely. There's no doubt whatsoever about it. They are using HARP. And if you go into the, the weather warfare treaties to do with HARP, you'll find that... Um, they admit that they can put a secondary signal on the harp as a carrier, and they can certainly manipulate the brains. And Brzezinski did put that in his own book, Between Two Ages, written in the 1970s. that they would use it on the whole continents. They are using it. It's very important. See, it's irresistible for governments not to use uh, any technique whatsoever for control, uh, and that includes uh, harp-type technologies. It includes drugs and pharma. The history of fluoride is very, very old. In fact, going way back to the, the late 1800s, they knew what it did to the human brain, made them very passive. And um, we know that governments started to add it in. Uh, the communists were the first ones. And com- in fact, when communism took over Poland, that was one of the first things they did was put fluoride in the water when, uh, to make them passive. And uh, Germany did the same uh, to some of the countries that took over. And where we're at that too, of course, we find your own governments are doing it across the world because it's a must be. But that's only one chemical they add to it. They've even been talking about using lithium too under the pretext that they've, they've noticed that uh, some Japanese people at one point, one little island, where, where the drinking water was high in lithium, uh, made them awfully compliant, pleasant people, very obedient. And to that, and for government's control, that's, that's irresistible. They're going to use stuff, if not already. We know they already have put stuff in the water for a long, long time. The guys that dump it in don't even know what they're dumping in. They just do what they're told. And they get a good fat paycheck. And people get fat paychecks, believe me, can rationalize anything they do. It doesn't matter if it's a cop an execution squad or anything else, they'll always rationalize what they do. This article came out of India, uh, the Hindu, and it says scientists target drugs that improve behavior. And it says um, appeal to enhance moral behavior. It doesn't see I like how it's even the terminology. Not, not, remember these are written by, it's, you know, neuroethicists as they call it. Uh, which means that they lie to you. Uh, they, they, they want to modify your behavior. So they say enhance. No, it's to modify moral behavior. After all, what is morality? Who decides what morality is? Huh? Who decides that? Well, government decides it for you, by the way. A treatment for, ra- and, and a treatment for racist thoughts. A therapy to, to increase your empathy for people in other countries. That's what you feel better paying taxes, by the way. I'm not kidding about that. This may sound like the stuff of science fiction, but with medicine getting closer to altering our moral state, uh, and by God, we're, we're at the end of any morality at all. It's all, as you can say, relative, but I wonder who it's related to, more like uh, old Nick. Society should be preparing for the consequences, according to a book that reviews scientific developments in the field. A drug such as Prozac that alter patients' mental state have already had an impact on moral behavior. It's caused a lot of murders and suicides. But scientists predict that future medical advances may allow much more sophisticated manipulations. 
It says the field is in its infancy, but it's very far from being science fiction, said Dr. Guy Cahan, or Cahan, Deputy Director of the Oxford Centre for Neuroethics and a Wellcome Trust Biomedical Ethics Award winner. That means he's done a lot of work for Big Pharma. Science has ignored the question of moral improvement so far, but no, it's not. That's a big lie, too. But it's now becoming a bit a big debate, he said, because H.G. Wells talked about in the 1920s. There's already a growing body of research you can describe in these terms. Studies show that certain drugs affect the ways people respond to moral dilemmas by increasing their sense of empathy, uh, group affiliation, and by reducing aggression. I guess he's talking about ecstasy drugs, so that's apparently that's what that does. Researchers have become very interested in developing biomedical technologies capable of intervening in the biological processes that affect moral behavior and moral thinking. Now, you should really get to know what they mean by moral thinking and moral behavior. They mean doing what you're told, or being obedient to every dictate that comes down from above. So... It says here, drugs that affect the moral thinking behavior already exist, but we tend not to think of them in that way. And he goes on to talk about Prozac again, and then he says um, it could make people more agreeable. Well, is it right to make someone agreeable when that person's going to do you in? I don't think so. He says, or uh, oxytocin, the so-called love hormone, increases feelings of social bonding and empathy while reducing anxiety, he said. Well, it'll also make you feel like you're going to give birth to a baby. But anyway, scientists will defer, develop more of these drugs and create new ways of taking drugs we already know about. We can already, for example, take prescribed doses of oxytocin as a nasal spray, he said. But would pharmacologically introduced altruism, for example, uh, amount to genuine moral behavior? Guy Cahane, uh, Deputy Director of the Oxford Center for Neuroethics and Wilcom Trust by the award winner, blah, 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 said. We can change people's emotion responses, but quite whether that improves their moral behavior is not something science can answer. He also admitted that it was unlikely people would rush to take a pill that would make them morally better. And they know all this stuff, too, and they've already had big meetings about putting your water and your food and everything else. Even spraying it on you, by the way. Becoming more trusting. Do you want to be more trusting when you've got a bunch of people who rip you off like bankers at the top, plunder you? Millions get homeless because of it. And, and you all get screwed for more taxes. Do you want to be more trusting, folks? Nicer, less aggressive and less violent can make you more vulnerable to exploitation, he said. No kidding. On the other hand, it could improve your relationships or help your career. So you'll be utterly poor on the street, but you have a good love life, right? Cahane does not advocate putting morality drugs in the water supply. No, he won't, you know, not openly. But I suggest that if administered widely, they might help humanity to tackle global issues. Relating to the plight of people on the other side of the world or of future generations is not in our nature, he said. This new body of drugs could make possible feelings of global affiliation and of abstract empathy for future generations. And it says, Rod Ter Mullen, Chair in Ethics and Medicine and Director of the Center for Ethics and Medicine at the University of Bristol warned that while some drugs can improve moral behavior, other drugs, and sometimes the same ones, can have the opposite effect. Well, as I say, there's been umpteen murders with folk on Prozac. They just go crazy and they don't know they're doing it. And it's very sudden. Listen, the use of deep brain stimulation helped to, to, uh, to help us with Parkinson's disease has, has, uh, has had unintended consequences, leading, leading to cases where patients begin stealing from shops and even become sexually aggressive, he added. Uh, basic moral behavior is to be helpful to others, feel responsible to others, have a sense of solidarity and sense of justice. I'm not sure that drugs can ever achieve this, but there's no question they can make us more likable, more social, less aggressive, more open attitudes to other people. He said, well, maybe you should give it to all the politicians and all these people. So when we come and say, would you mind stop taxing us and, and cut out these taxes? They'll say, well, that's a good idea. We'll do that. And thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. We'll do that. No problem at all. Hmm? Also given the test for psychopathy as well. None of them would pass it, mind you. And Mullen also suggested that moral enhancement drugs might be used in the criminal justice system. That's what they call it, the criminal justice system. You know, It's criminal what they do. Uh, these drugs will be more effective in prevention and cure than prison, he said. So uh, I love how scientists have total faith in everything. It's just like... Um, a documentary I watched on uh, the 50s and 60s to do with atomic energy, and all and they showed you some of the ads were getting put on television. Oh, it's going to be a wonderful utopia, cheap, cheap, cheap energy everywhere. Eventually, there'd be robots doing everything, and, and science would make your life so much easier. You don't have to work one or two days out of the week, and um, 
And on and on it went, you know, with all these experts conning us once again. After all, it's our tax money that builds our sciences for them. We build our own chains. Back after this. Hi folks, we're back, cutting through the matrix, and it's interesting too, I've mentioned before how if you read the writings of Lenin uh, and Marx and other ones, uh, Lenin especially, he said that the dictatorship, it's not off the proletariat, it's over the proletariat obviously, uh, wouldn't only, would last only for about a generation or so. It says, and then he said eventually it would merge with the West and be not quite capitalist, not quite communist. And of course he meant socialist with the banks on top. Of course they all knew that. They all knew what they were doing. 